All right, let's open our Bibles and go to the book of Esther. Esther and chapter 2 this evening. Esther chapter 2. And before we start chapter 2, let me read verse 22 of chapter 1 as we get started. For he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, to this effect, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. So Vashti refused to come at the king's uh, beckoning so he could show her off um, and um, for that sort of disrespect in front of all of his servants and subjects, uh, they said, we got to do something about this. Let's start at verse 1 of chapter 2. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done, what was decreed against her. Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, let there be fair young virgins sought for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan the palace, to the house of the women, under the custody of Hege, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their things for purification be given them. Verse 4, And let the maiden which pleaseth the king be queen instead of Vashti, and the thing pleased the king, and he did so. The fair young virgins, verse 2, uh, put the text prophetically in the Great Tribulation. And uh, they're referred to again in Christ's parable of the ten virgins, or I should, should say uh, alluded to, or hinted at, prefigured, foreshadowed, uh, in Matthew chapter 25, about verses 1 through 12, 1 through 13, long in there. And they're found eventually in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, and verses 1 through 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. What we read in the book of Esther might not match the uh, tribulation timetable exactly, but it points to a, a tribulation scenario, a tribulation situation. A Gentile queen uh, or Gentile bride has been set aside and young virgins now appear, are called uh, front and center. Vashti has been put away according to, quote, the laws of the Persians and the Medes, chapter 1, verse 19 said last time, which those laws were unalterable. She has no chance now of recovering from this divorce. Uh, therefore, a remarriage in such a case uh, is and was allowed. And what follows is that all the fair young virgins throughout 127 provinces of the Persian Mede Empire are gathered by appointed officers uh, and brought to the king's palace. And they're placed in the care of a servant, Hege. Verse 3 spells it, or according to verse 3, and it's spelled Hegei, H-E-G-A-I, later in verse 8 and also verse 15, who was probably a eunuch, but he had um, authority over the women to help them prepare themselves for the uh, eventual beauty contest. And they're gathering women from all around the uh, kingdom, 127 provinces. If each province or each city uh, supplied even one young maiden, probably more than one, who did all they could to qualify to get uh, brought and possibly become the next queen of the empire. He had quite a, a harem, as you might call it, of women. Verses 5 through 7, let's read those. Now in Shushan the palace there was a certain Jew, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, 
the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And he brought up Hadassah, that is, Esther, his uncle's daughter, which would make her his cousin. For she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, or Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took her, uh, took for her, excuse me, took for his own daughter. The word Jew occurs for the first time in this book, there in verse 5. The term Jew is derived from the, the tribe of Judah, uh, not Benjamin, from which uh, Mordecai and uh, Esther were come. But the tribe of, but however, since the tribe of Benjamin was part of the southern kingdom of Judah, you can see how Jew, a, a Hebrew from any one of the tribes, eventually was referred to as a Jew. Uh, even as it is today, although most Jewish people have no idea which tribe their own family has descended from. Those records were lost. There's something, they have just enough grasp on their ancestry to know that their ancestors were of Jewish extraction, but over the centuries and being driven from pillar to post and kicked from one country to another and etc., that they don't know which tribe they are from. They have a few guesses based on a, a few things, but, um, for example, the, the last name, the Jewish name, Kohen. Kohen is the Hebrew word for priest. So a lot of people think the Jews whose last name is Kohen must have naturally come from the tribe of Levi, the, the tribe of priests. But even that, I think, is uh, speculative, but so the idea of a, her being called a, a Jew or him being called a Jew um, when he wasn't from Judah is not really a problem. There is a slight problem suggested by the text in verses 5 and 6. Let me read those two again. Now in Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And the problem, quote, unquote, has to do with the, the age of Mordecai. If he was the son of Jair, uh, and the son or grandson of Shimei, the son of Kish, and was taken captive into Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, as verse 6 says he was, um, and Kish being his immediate great-grandfather, then Mordecai would have been somewhere between 120 and 133 years old at this time. And his younger uh, cousin, Esther, wouldn't have been a fair young virgin either at this time. Um, such longevity hadn't been seen since Moses died at 120 years old, according to Deuteronomy chapter 34. And Abraham fathered a son when he was 99 years old. But uh, Romans chapter 4 um, states that was the miraculous hand of God, allowing him to uh, be able to be a father at that age. Shimei and Kish uh, then have to be ancestral fathers, not immediate father, grandfather, great-grandfather. And that's not unusual. When we studied the book of Matthew, the first chapters, uh, first chapter of Matthew in Christ's genealogy, uh, someone called a father might not have been an immediate father, could have been uh, several generations back but recognized as the father of his descendants to, to come. And uh, if that's the case, then Mordecai and Esther's ages are more within acceptable age brackets. 
And there's also the likelihood or the possibility, actually probably a great probability, that some of the secular uh, historians or secular um, accounts trying to date historic events, uh, and sometimes it requires them to substitute one name for another, saying, well, the Bible's account had the wrong name for this king uh, at that particular time. There's the possibility and probably the likelihood that that kind of reckoning is off, is off. Uh, which so, so the alleged problems often raised with the Bible and the Bible's narrative are not absolute and undoubted, undoubtable problems. There's always a possibility of, of understanding if you take other things into account. Um, verse 7, let me read that again. And he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. Verse 7 introduces Esther into the narrative. Her Hebrew name was Hadassah. <clears throat> her per Persian name, <clears throat> Esther, meant a star. And it's a variant of the word uh, uh, Ishtar, uh, Ashtoreth, and so forth. Isis, etc. Verses 8 and 9. So it came to pass, when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace, to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house, to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her her things for purification with such things as belonged to her, and seven maidens, which were meet to be given her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. What you see in those two verses, verses 8 and 9, is undoubtedly the hand of God working behind the scenes. There was no reason for Hegei to prefer or to favor Esther over maybe a hundred to two hundred other young maidens that had been gathered, uh, except that God was moving in the man's heart in this particular matter. Uh, I want you to turn, if you will, to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. So Daniel, so God begins moving in the behind the scenes and operating to put some interest into uh, Hege or Hegei to prefer Esther over all the others. And uh, I think a lot of people, even a lot of Christians, forget that we're living for God. And God can control the circumstances and control the um, events so that his, his desired outcome uh, will take place just the same, even allowing for human will and human decision-making along the way. But notice Daniel chapter 1, when Daniel and his three friends were taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible says here in verse 17, As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Um, also verse 20, up to this point, verse 20, And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And he's helping to elevate Esther above all the other women that had been assembled in the uh, capital. All, in fact, along those lines, look back at Exodus 
31. Exodus 31. Exodus 31. And notice there verses 2 and 3. Here God speaking to Moses. Exodus 31, verses 2 and 3. See, I have called by name Bezaleel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. He was going to be in charge of knowing how to construct the tabernacle, all the furniture that needed to go into it. How do you cast something out of solid gold? How do you, like they did with the, the ark, how do you make curtains according to the descriptions uh, woven with the uh, pomegranates and bells on the ed edges of the priest's garments and so forth? Um, and uh, the Bible doesn't indicate that Moses knew anything about sewing and but uh, the bible said moses was learned in all the wisdom of the egyptians but it needed this required uh extra wisdom that only god could supply to someone as needed so i guess i could say uh god is providing whatever the jew needs to survive whether in the wilderness with moses uh, or in captivity as or in the Persian Empire, um, left over after the Babylonian captivity, here with Mordecai and Esther. Eventually, Haman wants to kill every Jewish person in the empire, and they're going to need someone in high places who can speak on their behalf. And so God is putting a young Jewish orphan, orphan <clears throat> girl in place to eventually become the queen of the entire empire before that time comes. So he starts moving the heart of Haggai to prefer Esther. And verse 9 uh, in our text tonight says that he um, speedily gave her her things for purification. He gave her every potion and lotion and notion, I guess, uh, along with seven maids. Um, these would have been her makeup artists and her uh, wardrobe consultants. So by the time they got done making her up, she was the most <laughs> beautiful uh, woman in the entire contest and had favor not only with the servant himself, but naturally with the king when the time came. Um, She's given the best place of the house of the women, according to verse 9. So she's at the top spot in the harem of these women assembled. And God is positioning her to become queen from India to the east, all the way to Ethiopia, uh, westward, when the time comes, in order to save her people. Look at verses 10 and 11, if you will. Let me... Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. Esther hides the fact that she's a Jew at Mordecai's command. Look forward at verse 20. Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had charged her for Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. So she's grown up obeying his command and his authority over her. He raised her as though he were her father. Haggai is unaware of her race, and the question never comes up in her um, preparations to go become the king's bride. Mordecai obviously had some position of authority 
in the kingdom. Look also forward at verse 19. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. The gate of a city in Bible times was where the city elders would conduct business and where judges would hold court. Look back at a couple of references. Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy 16. Deuteronomy 16, verse 18. Judges and officers <clears throat> and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. And also go forward to the book of Ruth. Joshua judges Ruth. It's a small little book. Ruth chapter 4. Ruth chapter 4 and uh, verses 1 and 2. Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there, and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such an one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city, so they must have been there also, and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. So the gate was where the elders of the city would gather and congregate and discuss city affairs, city business. And uh, some common man off the street would not be permitted to assemble there with the important uh, people in charge. And uh, you recall how um, Lot sat at the gate of Sodom when the two men came into that city. Uh, he had gained some stature or some position of prominence even in his day. All right, I'm going to stop there for tonight. And uh, there's 11 verses that we looked at briefly. And if there's more that I think we should go back and uh, observe uh, next time, we'll do that. Otherwise, we'll pick up at verse 12 and keep going. Let's pray and we'll continue and uh, we'll conclude for this evening. Heavenly Father, thank you for your mercy and love toward us. We ask that you'd be our ultimate teacher of these things. Help us to be good students week by week and day by day. And we ask that we'd see Jesus Christ and the glory of God um, displayed in the story of Esther. Thank you for uh, the way you pre preserve the Jewish uh, race, the Jewish nation through this exciting story. We pray that we'll um, do it justice along the way. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.